welcome everyone uh, to the stream tonight. Tonight we're probably going to be going into more detail about SARS-CoV-2, or as you guys all call it, the coronavirus. Remember, the coronavirus is a family of viruses. It represents hundreds of different viruses. So I hate calling it the coronavirus. If I say coronavirus, I'll probably say the novel coronavirus, because that's sometimes the way we refer to it. Uh, but SARS-CoV-2 it's a technical way of referring to it. COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 19, because it was first discovered December 2019, is the actual disease state or symptomatic state that the virus causes. So just to get some nomenclature down, um, coronavirus is a family of viruses and SARS-CoV-2 is the actual scientific name for this particular virus that you see in manuscripts and things like that. And COVID-19 is the pathological state the virus causes. Everything I say tonight is changing science. It gets updated with every new publication. It could very well be completely different tomorrow. I don't make any statements about what's going to happen to this virus, the future of the virus. I am not an epidemiologist. I know molecular biology, cell biology, and I know how this virus affects anatomy and physiology or based on what we know so far, how it affects anatomy and physiology with the immune system, the lungs, and whatnot. I am not advocating what you should do, how you should act, talking. I like to avoid any political content because that just makes my blood boil, reading all the stuff I hear. And tonight we are hopefully focused on the science, but just to give the aside, I am not a professional epidemiologist, so you should listen to those people, not me. I am just here looking at the science of the new papers that come out. All right, so there's this paper that came out uh, earlier this week. So on the origin of continuing, so what this paper looked at was looking at the evolution of SARS-CoV-2. So this is an RNA-based virus and it could have little changes in it that could naturally mutate. Lots of these viruses are replicating and this replication process isn't perfect. So it could eventually create a strain that's slightly different nucleotide sequence than the previous one. So that's what this paper was looking at. And this kind of uh, goes with this website here called nextstrain.org. This one's trying to map. Yeah, so this is looking at the evolution of it. So here you see the purple out here and the, you know, the red bubbles out here. And you can click play here and look at how these... So they've sequenced all these strains as they spread. And you can see these different strains popping up in different regions of so a certain uh, sequence pops up over here. It could suggest that where it came from and so forth. And that really helps in terms of epidemiology map the virus to see where it's going. And even these mutations could have different virulences. Um, so the way you describe a virus is its fitness, its virulence, which is its pathogen and transmissibility. Uh, transmiss Missibility, so how easy is it transmitted? It's virulence factor, so based on how easy it is transmitted, how easy does it also then cause pathogenicity in the individual? And then uh, it's fitness, how long can it survive um, outside of a host? Uh, so different things like that come into play when describing a virus and little mutations in the genes could change one of those, could make it more transmissible, uh, could give it more fitness. Um, now, this paper, uh, that we're about to talk about, use the term makes it more aggressive, this new strain. And aggressive isn't a way to describe viruses. But here, this is really, really cool that we could see how these different strains are evolving. So there it says on the nucleotide mutations, amino acid mutation at ORF 1B. ORF stands for open reading frame. So it's just a sequence of messenger RNA that's expressed. But yeah, so this is, they're following this now for this virus, which is pretty cool and this is one way that we can map evolution now as well we can see how different organisms are related based on different genetic changes that have occurred in the past and we can build and update our phylogenetic trees for the you know, evolution of down here then it's looking at where some of these mutations took place um, so this is the orf1 or open reading frame one is open reading frame 1b right here is a big one this is the s protein. So the S protein is the spike protein. The spike protein is what sticks off the virus. So let's draw this virus. So this is the virus. This is the phospholipid membrane surrounding the virus. Now this virus 
has different proteins. So let's say that's one, that's another, that's another. So these ones here are this spike protein. To make this virus, you have to make that spike protein. So these red things here are the spike protein. I believe this, these orange ones are the M, and then this is the phospholipid membrane that makes up the outside, which is important. And then the yellow, I think is the N. So there's an, an S protein, an M protein, an N protein. I believe there's an E one as well. Uh, so right there's E. So E, M, N, so let's zoom back in here. What these are representing down here are those different proteins. And so this is the messenger RNA. This is how it works. Do you guys know how a gene becomes a protein? So do you guys know the process of how a virus gets into a cell? And in this case, how this messenger RNA virus gets into its cell and replicates itself. If not, I, I can do a quick lecture on that if uh, you guys are interested. Let's attempt to explain it like we're five. <sighs> Here's the virus. Here is your cell. Your cell is massive compared to this virus. In the center of your cell, <laughs> you have your nucleus, which holds DNA. DNA decides what all your proteins are and what you are. So the central dogma in biology, you go from DNA to RNA, in this case, messenger RNA, to protein. So that's, that's what you're doing. You're going from DNA, which is double-stranded, to RNA, which is single-stranded, to proteins, which are a chain of amino acids that then fold together and form this unique structure. These are proteins sticking out. So these are globular proteins sticking out. Now there is some stuff that happens to this messenger RNA here in eukaryotes, so we are eukaryotic. And so there's this chain of um, adenines, it's called the poly A tail, and then there's a five prime guanine cap on it. So this would be the five prime end, this is the three prime end. And this is, this prime, these numbers, are just a way to describe the directionality of the messenger RNA. So how do we turn that messenger RNA into protein? Every three bases codes for an amino acid. So a ribosome comes in, latches down on that, and goes this way. As it moves down through, it squirts out a protein. So this is a protein then. This whole process here is gene expression. So going from DNA to RNA to protein. So why, why am I even talking about this? Why does this matter? So this virus has a very, very massive single-stranded RNA structure inside of it. These are all nucleotides coming off. It's I forget the actual length of the genome but it's very large how does this virus get into the cell we have a, a good idea on how that happens so here there is this receptor that we believe exists on your cell this is called the ace 2 receptor so this spike protein actually binds to that ace 2 receptor and that's how it gets into your cell you, it forms this union and because I know this isn't the five-year-old part here. When it enters, your plasma membrane here is a phospholipid bilayer. This is also a phospholipid bilayer. I know it's hard to see these little phospholipids. So this is what a phospholipid looks like. Your cell is made up of a whole bunch of these. So when I draw these lines, it represents this. This side is water loving or hydrophilic. Same with this side down here. In the middle here, is hydrophobic or water fearing, like a phobia. Uh, why does that matter? It's because when these two cell membranes fuse, it actually allows the virus to open up and put its stuff inside the cell. So let's fast forward here. This spike protein will fuse to that receptor and then these membranes will come together. So let's imagine they fuse now. So this is the virus that has now fused with it. We have the spike proteins that are still here then this is that long strain of messenger RNA is then released into the cell. In biology, this process is called endocytosis. All right, so when this gets into your cell, it now uses your machinery and replicates itself. This is what we call a positive sense RNA. That means this is very similar to messenger RNA that your DNA makes. So it has this poly A tail on it at the three prime end, and it has this five prime cap on it so all it needs are ribosomes ribosomes come in and make all these proteins then so when when i was showing this link earlier this one here it makes all these proteins then 
Is there a protect the ACE2 so it can't? That's an idea. Um, can we inhibit the binding to ACE2? And there's a suggestion that the actual binding of that S protein to the ACE2 receptor has a what's known as a priming step via something called a protease. And there's a known clinical drug that could inhibit that priming step. So that's an idea that could, I read a paper on that earlier this week of how that priming step could be inhibited and then that S protein never binds to the ACE2 receptor, but that takes some more work to look into. So the ribosome attaches right here and ratchets along this way now, and we spit out the new protein. So one protein will, will spit out here. This could be the protein for the spike protein. And next one could be the M protein. And so it just makes, oh, that's a big brush size. Uh, so next one is then the M protein, making this protein and then it all assembles itself back into the structure. And now how does it get out? So let's draw the rough ER. So this is the rough ER and it's studded with ribosomes. So if it's studded with ribosomes, it's a protein factory. So when some of these RNAs start being, well, some of these proteins start being made, it carries the structure over here. So then these proteins actually get made into the rough ER and embed themselves in the membrane here. And let's say we're, we're adding the blue one. Let's put a blue line out here now too for the other one. Then the rough ER creates what's called a secretory vesicle. What's a secretory vesicle? It's pretty much a little miniature cell inside your body. So this pinches out a little vesicle. Remember, this is a, a bilayer and this little vesicle now pitches off. Let's imagine this has happened. And we have a little bilayer here. This is a bad representation of it, but we'll get there. And then here we have the proteins sticking in this little bilayer now. And then here's the, the blue one. Okay, now we have this little, little cell inside here. So then we have the Golgi. The Golgi is this little flattened disc-like thing. It has a shipping and receiving side. So it receives the packages and then ships them out. So how does it do that? This actually fuses with the Golgi. So this is rough ER. Forgot to write that up there. Now this is the Golgi. So these vesicles fuse here. Pretty much the Golgi proteins need to fold in the correct shape. The Golgi helps provide the environment for that folding and then ships them to where they need to go. Some of these cell vesicles stay in the cell and act as things called lysosomes. Some get sent out. So let's say, and some make transmembrane proteins. These proteins are called transmembrane proteins, um, at least when they're in this state here. Now let's say we're shipping this out. So my yellow now is gonna become purple. Uh, so here, let's redraw these proteins, which now appear on this side. And let's add the blue protein in here. Boom, and now we pinch off another vesicle. So we now have the purple vesicle. So boom, there's another vesicle. So these vesicles are really cool. So if, if someone hosts me right now, Something's gonna pop up up there. You guys know my host alert? What happens in my host alert? We have the vesicles. There it is. So the hater's gonna hate. You see that big blob walking on the back? That's a vesicle moving down. <laughs> Out of steel art, thank you for the host. So that's a vesicle walking down these microtubule tracks. There's this highway of microtubules in your cell. And that's what these balls that I'm drawing here walk down on. How this gets out then, is it just, fuses with the cell membrane and leaves. There are receptors here that can bind to this and it just exits the cell then. And that's how the virus replicates itself. Um, it would get the RNA repacked in it then as well. Um, here that's supposed to be purple, but I'm not drawing it purple. The RNA will get repacked and then you can release this virus into the environment. Not only that, so this happens in what are called type two alveolar cells or type two pneumocytes. I know we talked about this last week, but these produce something called surfactant. These cells now have these receptors on them. Antibodies could come in. When your body starts making an immune response, antibodies would come in. Am I drawing this right? I think so. So it'd be hydrogen bond there, there, and then these would be the binding region. So this is a rough version of an IgG or an immunoglobulin antibody. So these come in, they bind to this and label these cells then for the immune system to destroy them. Your immune system thinks these cells are foreign. 
So then you begin to lose these type 2 alveolar cells because there's a lot of inflammation in a region, and that's where the pneumonia symptoms start appearing. But I, I feel like going over how this process works, how this virus replicates and then gets out is very important.